open the door, light the way. This one is not a commission. This one is Older Gods. We are getting closer to October, so maybe start getting into the mood for this. Disclosure up front. Um, while this is available streaming in a few places at this point, I was provided a screener of this for the purposes of review, and the reason I got that was because I am friends with a member of the crew of this movie. There's your disclosure. I don't know the main actors. I don't know the writer, director, any of the primary creative forces in it, but I am friends with somebody who's on the crew. So just so you're aware. Now, Older Gods is a uh, Lovecraftian, I let's go with suspense. Horror movie wouldn't be inaccurate. There's certainly towards the very end some definitely more gory aspects, but it's largely dealing with suspense and tension. And this is where I get to talk a bit about low budget filmmaking. I tend to not dwell overly on how much money was spent on a movie. Um, I'll bring it up on occasion, but for the most part, I don't. And if I do, it's usually in terms of being surprised at what was accomplished on the budget that they had. So here's why I'm going to bring it up here. When you are looking at something that knew from the inception of the script that it was going to be a low-budget production, there are a lot of choices that are going to be made as a direct result of that. Here's what I mean by that. If you come across something that feels like maybe it's a little bit of a flaw or a fault, it does help to know whether there were budgetary constraints, the, you know, mainly time and money, those two being very much linked. If they didn't have enough money or they didn't have enough time and a decision appears to have been made, it is worth evaluating, was that a purely creative decision or was that a decision forced by lack of resources? Here's why I think that matters. Because if a movie has basically all the money it needs to do what it's trying to do, and it still does something that doesn't work and fails at it or makes an artistic choice that just doesn't work, that is a case of the artistic choice does not work. When you're dealing with smaller budget, you, I think, do have to make some allowances for, okay, I'm not sure that was the best choice artistically in a vacuum if they had all options open, but if I take into account the fact that they probably couldn't afford uh, to do a, like a crane shot or a steady cam or a dolly or more actors or more locations or to build a set that they had total control of. Understanding those limitations and knowing what the limitations would have been is the choice they made. Does it, is it the best option of what they could have done? Because it's a little bit of a forced choice in that a whole bunch of things go off the table because you have limited resources. But there is still an artistic choice to be made because you can still make what is a bad choice out of your limited options. There still might have been a better way to have done that. And all this is why I think in general, especially in something like this, acknowledging that it is low budget is important because I actually think appreciation of it kind of depends on knowing that it's a lower budget. I don't mean to use that as an excuse because low budget films should be held to a standard. However, if your criticism of something like this is that there isn't a completely 100% photorealistic uh, five-story CG monster destroying the city of London, that was never on the table. They could never have done that. So understanding the constraints, I think, is important. But as I said, you still have to uh, assess, did they make what was actually a good choice out of the limited options they had. And if it sounds like I'm kind of setting it up to tear into this regardless of the budget, I'm not. I actually think that by and large, they make very smart choices with the very clear limited resources that they had, which is a very small cast, basically only two locations. There's like a little bit, some other places, but effectively all they have is this house and the woods. That's it. That is what they are working with. And honestly, there is a handful of uh, CG shots, I think probably totaling about 20 seconds in the whole movie. So don't let me make you think that this is a big part of it. But when they're there, they are shockingly good for how low I know the budget was on this thing. So I would say that this is a movie that does incredibly well making good use of its budget. But... Going in, you should know that that budget was limited because if you went into this movie and 
didn't know it was a low budget and just thought, well, you know, it's it's a movie like anything else. You might find yourself being harsher than it deserves. It'd be like, I don't know, if somebody showed, this is going to be a weird comparison given this movie, and I, and I will get more into it, but it'd be like showing somebody clerks and they don't, and the person who sees it doesn't know that it was made on a shoestring budget with non-actors and they'd be going, why is every shot locked off like that? Why are these people like not that good at delivering these lines? Like what, why did they do it this way? Like they did it this way because it was the only way it was going to get done. So if you understand and appreciate the low resources that this has, I think it's quite good. It benefits definitely from being lean. This is an 80 minute movie, which is exactly how long it should be. Um, we deal primarily with a character named Christopher who goes to this um, sort of cottage out in out in Wales, this remote cottage where a childhood friend of his named Billy recently took his own life. And he's following kind of a trail of breadcrumbs that Billy left for him that had to do with tracking down these, for lack of a better way to put it, kind of a cult. And this is going in a Lovecraftian direction. That's not really a spoiler. That's you know, that's in the marketing material. You can, you look into it at all and it will be described as Lovecraftian. So Christian is, is looking into all this and um, trying to find out what it was that happened and getting, you know, the kind of information and learning the kind of things that push you to the edge a little bit. So it's exploring his current state of mind and how he's coping with this as weirder and weirder stuff happens both in and outside of the cabin and we learn more about what it was that Billy uncovered and it is it is pretty dang good. If there's one like actual criticism I'm going to give it's to some of the American accents. Now this was made in the UK and while I couldn't confirm for every actor definitely the lead uh is not American. His accent was good enough. I'd like, it was good enough. It was, I could tell that it wasn't his normal accent, but he did it well enough that it wasn't distracting. That said, there's a couple of characters that he has to talk to on the phone who we never see, but we do hear their voices. Those performances, I don't want to say that they're bad, but they, they feel off and they sound really hampered by trying to maintain an American accent. Um, so whereas Christian, you maybe give a little bit more leeway because you get to... Um, see how well he's doing the physical acting of the part that he, you don't have to lean entirely on the voice. The few performers who are doing American accents where all you have is the voice, they're, they're not great. And it's, I don't know how much of it was the accent, how much of it was compounded by the fact that I believe, like I'd have to see it written down, I think a lot of their dialogue was also some of the more flatly expositional stuff. So it was a little bit, a little bit of what I tend to think of, of as you know, dialogue where characters are saying something to another character that in reality they wouldn't have to tell them that that person already knows that and it's set for the sake of the audience now sometimes you do have to do that to a certain extent but there are ways to do it where it doesn't sound like you've prefaced the line with well as you know and then just had a character tell somebody something they clearly already know unfortunately these characters uh over the phone do suffer from that a little I think either if they were permitted to not have to put on an American accent, um, then they might have been able to deliver the lines to cover up the fact that they are as expositional as they are. Or if they were still going to do the accent and the lines were less overtly expositional, it probably would have balanced a little better. But between those two factors, those, those did bring it down a little bit. But I want to emphasize, those are pretty minor parts of the movie. But they did kind of stand out to me as like, eh... How much would better I'm going to find out that at least one of those two performers is actually American? If that is the case, then I guess I'm actually just criticizing the performance. So, eh, whatever the case may be, I'm assuming that they're put on accents because the performances really did feel like that kind of self-conscious that you get from someone who hasn't totally settled into the voice they're using. But that is supposition on my part. I put my hand up and I grant that. But... By and large, the tension in the mood of this is really, really good. It makes very, very strong use of the limited resources it has. It has an excellent soundtrack and sound design. It is very intelligently shot and framed in terms of the way that it 
puts you know emphasis on this part of the frame and ignoring that but then oh there's something there it there aren't really a lot of jump scares there was really only one bit that got a jump out of me and it it was it was what i would call a like a fair jump scare like it did get me uh and i don't love being jump startled generally but it it felt like um i was actually experienced what the what the character in question was because it was this little ooh okay but I also got it. It wasn't hammered so hard that it felt like it was trying to, you know, get me to fully jump out of my seat. It just startled me, which felt like a good balance. And like I said, it only did it the once. But the the way that it builds and the sense of dread to it is pretty dang solid and pretty good. The performances, um, aside from the ones on the phone that I mentioned, are solid. They're not amazing. They're not phenomenal, but for what was probably a very tight shooting schedule. No, they're pretty good. And overall, this is a case where I think if you go in knowing they had very little money, very little time, it is the kind of thing you come out going, dang, I kind of want to see what they do with proper resources. That's the kind of feeling that I get coming out of this. If this writer, director, and or any part of his cast or crew go on to bigger and better things, this is absolutely going to stand as a look back at it and go, oh, you could see the early promise there. And if none of them ever do, it may instead stand as a, hmm, I bet you they could have done more. Because while it is not a towering achievement unto itself, it shows a lot of talent. And I still absolutely did enjoy it. So if you like Lovecraftian horror in general, if you have an appreciation for lower budget, tension-filled movies, yeah, I'd say give this a go. It's also got like some really interesting ideas, just where the title comes from, older gods, not elder gods, not old gods, older gods. There's like one little um, piece of dialogue that explains that. And I love it, like as a concept. I love the explanation for where that title comes from. So even within, you know, the standard Lovecraftian, oh, there's the, you know, the the sense of greater horror is out there, which is inherent to the genre. Even within that, it's still got some interesting ideas in there. So yeah, yeah, I I liked this. Understand what it is going in, but I did enjoy this. Older Gods, have you seen it? What'd you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon pays the bills, enables me to do this as my living, even if you can't help me out that way. Like, share, subscribe, help. There's links to other stuff in the description. Don't worry too much about it, though. We take a relaxed attitude around here so you can come on back next time you need a break. Shout out to the patrons who help make this possible. In particular, I want to thank Robin Moore, Zubin Lutfola, Goddess Elida, Tarak, the thing that goes doing to the anime, Ruth, Oliver B, Solitary Pictures, Ulrich Bogdan, Melinda Walters, Jen, Auntie Kate 808, Becky Sparks, Pranabilax, The Poodle, Robin Powell, T Love, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casper, Dave Hall, and Rosalind Bennett. There's being able to hear me try and pronounce your name, plus a whole bunch of other rewards on the Patreon. You can check out the tiers, but um if you're already on the list, thank you so much.